Yeah, I think it was like a July 4th weekend, and he needed a bass player. I mean, I wasn't really a bass player, but then Dad's like, you, you, you're going to have to play with us. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> Remember, I came up, got home from school one day. And he said, well, Paul put in his notice. Guess you're going to be my new banjo player. I mean, I was, I was glad. I was like, man, I was really just getting the hang of playing the bass. <laughs> Greetings, everybody. Keith Billick here. Thank you so much for joining me for another episode of the Picky Fingers Banjo Podcast. Happy to be sharing with you the first of a handful of episodes that I was able to record back at Delfest. You may remember me humble bragging that I got to go to Delfest and and do my podcasting thing and enjoy the music there. And what better way to kick off this series of episodes than with the fella who has played more banjo with Del McCurry than any other human alive and happens to have the same last name. I'm, I'm sure that's just a coincidence. But before we get started with that, this is my last chance to remind listeners that we do have a VIP lounge scheduled. That's a, that's a, uh, a video conference for very important pickers, and that is scheduled for this next Sunday, That's June 26th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. And how do you get invited to this VIP lounge to talk about banjos with me and your fellow listeners? All you have to do is head over to patreon.com slash banjo podcast and sign up to support the show so you can feel good about uh, keeping this podcast up and running so you can hear from more of your favorite banjo players. But then also you do get cool benefits in return and one of which is that vip lounge and we do also have to recognize today's very special patron of the show that's sean mckilney sean thank you so much for signing up at patreon and becoming a sponsor hope to see you at the vip lounge along with uh the rest of you so once again that's patreon.com slash banjo podcast the other ways to support the show are to you know, do all the liking and subscribing and rating and reviewing five stars only, please. And just spread the word to all of your banjo loving friends. And I think I've said this before, but if people around you don't love banjo, are they really your friends? Come on. Also, you can contact the show at picky fingers, banjo podcast at gmail.com. Let me hear all of your comments, suggestions, feedback, etc. Today's featured guest is Rob McCurry of the Del McCurry Band and the Travelin' McCurries. Rob has been one of the top banjo players in the business for many years, and I probably don't need to tell you his, his resume. He's played with his father, Del McCurry, for a long, long time, and in recent years has branched out to form the Travelin' McCurries with a lot of his bandmates from the Del McCurry Band as well. And I can attest, after... Having seen them uh, recently at Del Fest, both of those bands are going very strong, and Rob's banjo playing is a huge part of that. He can do everything from tasty, softer backup to funky, bluesy playing to absolutely blistering, hard-driving bluegrass banjo tunes. So all of that is what makes him one of your favorites. I get a lot of emails requesting this guest. So I'm very proud to introduce the conversation I had with Rob McCurry. (music) 
Usually my first question to people is how you got started and exposed to the banjo. With you, I imagine people kind of know already how, how that might have happened. Why don't you just get started? Talk about like your earliest memories of hearing music and I guess specifically... Uh, do you have a memory of a time that the banjo caught your ear at a really early age? Yeah, you know, growing up with my dad, there was there was always music. You know, he was always playing, and his yeah. guys in his band would come over and they'd play, and, and or they'd go out and play shows. And sometimes we could go as kids. You know, mm-hmm. you know, I always remembered liking music. You know, I was little. I thought, well, that's what everybody's dad does. You know, <laughs> right? They all, right. Yeah, they all go play shows and they get together with their buddies and jam. You know. Uh-huh which obviously was not the case, but I remember watching, because my dad, he taught me how to play the banjo, because mm-hmm. he's, he's also, he's, he's, <laughs> he's a good banjo player. Yeah. And uh, I remember him being around the house, and just, he'd get it out and just play. Okay. And watching him, and I was like, that's cool. I, I, I think I'd like to try that. And, but I hadn't yet. I just kept thinking about it a little bit. And there was a... Uh, there was a country music park called Sunset Park over yeah. in, over in uh, West Grove, Pennsylvania. And Dad would play over there pretty often through the summer. He'd go and, you know, they'd always bring in an Opry Act every every Sunday. It was a, They'd have an Opry Act, and a lot of times they'd have that country act, and they'd have a bluegrass opener. Cool. And Dad would open shows over there. And this uh, one particular Sunday, the Osborne Brothers were the Opry Act. Mm. And... Uh, I remember watching them, and I was like, I mean, I was, I, I mean, and now I know that I was really, I wasn't delusional. I was really hearing something that was incredible. Really yeah. special stuff. <laughs> yeah. So good. I mean, the Austin Brothers in the late 70s and just killing it, uh-huh. you know. And, uh, you know, when, when I heard what those guys were doing, that's kind of when the, when the, <laughs> the bell rung or whatever, you know. Right. Right. Like, I would really like to try and do this. And, uh, and so did you always enjoy doing that when you when you got to go to your dad's gigs and stuff? Was that or was that something they had to like force you to do? No, you know, I always liked it because I I just I like music, you mm-hmm. know. I mean I'd go out and run around and play with kids and stuff like that too, but yeah. but you know, I would also try and be around and pay attention to the show and the music, you know. Yeah. I just I don't remember a time not not enjoying music and, and yeah, you know, maybe wasn't always drawn to the banjo, but you know that's that's when I got bit. You know, I was, I think it was seventy nine because I was I was eight. Oh wow! When I started, yeah, still really young. When I started to learn, and still, I mean, Sonny's, you know, he's one of my favorites, of course, and yeah, Earl like and Earl, of course, and uh-huh. I remember when my dad when he first showed me, he first showed me the role. He's like, well, you know, if you're going to do this. Mm-hmm. You got to learn Earl. Uh-huh. You got to learn to play like Earl. Right. And from there, then you can take it anywhere you want to because that's the pattern. You know, that's the thing. You know, if you can learn to play like him, you can go, you know, the sky's the limit for you. Kind of. And of course, that's what Sonny and JD Crow did. They learned to play like Earl, but then they put their own twist on it. And so has everyone else. Yeah. You know, from, yeah. from those guys to, you know, Bela. You know. <laughs> I just find it interesting that of all the times that you must have heard whoever play banjo with your dad, what it must have been like, was that Paul Silvius maybe in those years or something like that? Uh, Paul was, actually Paul was in the band when I started with dad. With the bass? And with the bass, okay. yeah. And uh, yeah, when I, was, when I was young, he had, uh, Bill Runkle was the main guy. Early seventies up until you know, well, the late seventies. He was there for a long time. Great banjo player, and you know, 
you know, as I was coming along and learning to play, you know, it, all those guys, you know, they'd still get together and pick. I mean, they weren't in the band together anymore, but yeah. they were around. A, yeah. yeah, they'd have a gathering, they'd get together and they'd jam. And, <laughs> and all these guys would show me stuff, you know. Oh, that's cool. And uh, Bill Did Runkle, he would show me things. And Chris Warner, he was he was in Dad's band at, at a time. And, oh. you know, I remember, you know, he'd, he'd show me things. Paul was really good to me showing me things. And so was Dick Smith. I would love to hear, like, it, do you remember any specifics that you might even be able to demonstrate about things that they showed you that really helped you out at, at first? Um, well, I remember uh, Dick Smith, he, yeah, he had this, this old, you know, flathead Florentine, you know, mm -hmm. and I can remember being backstage, it was Wingap, Pennsylvania, and I was just a little kid. I mean, I was, I was really just learning to get both hands going. Uh -huh. I wasn't really playing, you know. And I remember they, they came off stage, and I was just back there. And, and Dick, he loves to talk. He's a great conversationalist. Yeah, yeah. You know? I've, I've learned that. I don't know him too well, but I've managed to get <laughs> myself into plenty of long conversations with him somehow. <laughs> and I don't remember who he was talking to, but he was talking to someone else. And uh, he, uh, <laughs> he, he just kind of you know, motioned for him and come over. Yeah. I can't, he still had his banjo on it around his neck. You know? And uh, he said, here, sit down. And I sat on the steps that went up to the backstage, and he hung that banjo around my neck, and he said, play it. And, you know, while he's talking, he's, he's kind of hearing what I'm doing, you know. And when he got done talking to that guy, he's like, here, I think this is what you were trying to do. And what was it? And you know, I, don't, I don't remember exactly okay. what it was, but it was like, it was one of those things. And my dad was so good at that, too. It's like, it was close, but it wasn't quite, you know. Mm -hmm. And be like, Oh, you, this is what you're missing right here. And it's like, oh, bang. You know, when you're right. a kid, it's your sponge. And it's like, oh, yeah, <laughs> that's how it goes. Now I got it, you know, and you move on. And I remember Paul, Paul Silvius, he was, he loved Earl's playing. And, and he would, like I would too. I mean, even when I first started and, and could get my hands on like these cassette tapes of Flat and Scruggs shows, live shows, oh, things, yeah, yeah. radio shows and and how, you know, Earl, he didn't, you know, he played, never really played anything the same way twice, mm -hmm. you know. And I can remember uh, Paul, he, he'd work something out and he'd, he'd show it to me, you know, and it'd be like note for note, you know. He was really good to me about that. And as I came on along, you know, I got to, you know, I got to know all these, you know, I got to meet Earl and hang with him and just watch, just to watch someone like that play, you know. And J.D. Crow and Sonny, I mean, they were good to me. Just let me play their banjos and maybe not necessarily say, hey, can you show me this? Right. But just to sit and watch and see how their hands work. Yeah. And, yeah, to see that to, up close. And, yeah, you're, And to hear that, you know, sitting as close as we are, to hear that tone that they get out of an instrument, mm -hmm. you know. Not even through a microphone, just straight through the yeah, air. Yeah, yeah right. just incredible. I can remember... Uh, the first time I played J.D.'s banjo, I'd been playing for a while. You know, I was already playing on the road with my dad. And he said, have you ever played my old banjo? And I said, no, I haven't. And he said, here. And he handed it to me. And I played it, and I was like, oh, this thing plays <laughs> so good, you know. And, you know, to, when, to watch him play, it looked like he was just tearing the strings off of it, you know. But he huh. wasn't. You know, he played hard. But he he knew where the threshold was. Right. You know? He hit it, and he and he would talk about that. You know, you hit it just hit it just hard enough to hit it to where it's almost getting ready to rattle, and then back off just a little bit. Yeah, you know, give yourself that, a little headroom. <laughs> find that sweet spot, you know. <laughs> and Sonny was so good at that too. He, he you know he told me before he said, "Let the banjo do the work." Mm -hmm. You know, don't overplay the thing. You know, that might be easier to say when you have such good sounding banjos <laughs> doing the work. For you. That's true, you know. I, I mean, it's it's totally true, you know. I've I've got an old original five string flathead, and it's I mean, it's a great instrument. And it's just when you have something really good like that, mm -hmm. it, that's that really holds true, you know. A lot of, I think a lot of instruments, and I have some of them, and have had some in the past. Just newer stuff, maybe. I mean, great, good stuff. You know, yeah. nothing wrong with it. But you kind of have to pull it out of them, you know. Well, yeah. It seems like the, the good old Gibson flatheads, they just have that, you know. And it, 
is that the main thing that you hear as being the, you know, that famous pre-war sound, which is sort of a moving target, of course. There's mm-hmm. many different versions of the pre-war sound, but like if you had to just encapsulate what it is that's magical about a bunch of those instruments, is, is that yeah. it, do you think? That they you don't yeah. have to work to get the, yeah. the sound out of it like you that? Know, I think so. You know, then, then it makes you wonder, too, you know, these old instruments were new at one time. Yeah. What were they like then? Uh-huh. You know, they probably like anything new. They get better with age. You know, sure. when Earl Scruggs was playing the old, that old 75, old Nelly that him and Don Reno, you know, they made that famous sure, trade. Sure. Yeah, that banjo was, it wasn't very old, you know. <laughs> I brought that up with Steve Huber that a lot of his early banjos right now are are the same age as a lot of the, you know, Earl's banjo in the late 50s that has on all sorts of famous recordings, you know, yeah. they're the, the same age. So mm-hmm. it's it's kind of funny see, seeing the comparisons that you can make now with, with those. Now, of course, recording and hide heads and everything else is, is, is all different too. So yeah, who, who knows? <clears throat> My dad, he, when my dad was playing, he was, you know, he was in the hide head era, you know. Yeah. Yeah, you know, they were a lot of work, but he's like, but the tone, you mm. know, that tone was just, but when plastic came out, it was a no brainer. You know? <laughs> yeah. Have you, have you experimented with a hide head at all on any of yours? I haven't. And I do have, I have a brand new hide head at home. A fella gave me, he's, he's making them and I'm sorry, I can't remember his name right off, but. Is this he's John a, Balch by any chance? Is he in Oregon by chance? I don't know, but he's he's probably the best known guy out there who's yeah. making like pre mounted yeah. Uh, yeah, skinheads. Yeah. yeah, okay. Yeah. I bet that's him. And um, once again, I'm sorry if I can't pull that out, but that's my plan. I, I, I need to, my old flathead needs some work. I need to get it, get the frets fixed and stuff. And I really need to, I'd like to get a, another neck for it and take the old neck out of it, really, but. Mm-hmm. I want to put that hide head over there and see what it sounds like, you know. Sonny told me, you know, in, in the later years, I mean, he was still playing and playing very well. They had, uh, they were going out for one show, you know, somewhere, a weekend with one show. And he took that old granada and he put a hide head on it. Oh. And he knew what the weather was going to be. It wasn't, you know, it was going to be pretty dry. It wasn't going to be too much of a headache. Yeah. And, uh, cool. He was like, man. You should have heard that thing, man. You should have heard the oh, tone. I, w- <laughs> I would love to hear what you think if you end up putting that on one of yours at, at yeah. some point. That, I'd be yeah. really curious. There's a fellow out in, in actually in eastern Oregon. He's got a great old uh, three. I think it's a three or 75. I think it's a three. And uh, the last time I saw it, he had one of those hide heads Ooh. on it. Man, that tone is something, you know, just big, you know, and. And and the notes decay kind of quick, you uh-huh. know, quickly, quicker than they do with plastic, you know. Yeah. But he's uh, yeah, that 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 just sounded so good. And Earl told me about putting uh, when he put the plastic head on his first one. He thought, well, he needed a head, and he yeah. couldn't get a hot head, but he could get a plastic head. And he thought, well, I'll just I'll put that thing on there, and and I'll use it till I can get a head. And he's like, he said. <laughs> But I put that head on there, and they, he said they played somewhere, and he said it was really damp at night. And he said you, you could see the water, like, drip, you know, running down the head. It was right. so damp. And he said it never changed its complexion. It, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he was sold on them, you know. He also told me one that he said they were doing the TV show. Yeah. And he said but before they'd go on, he'd go over and hold that hold the head of that banjo up to one of those heat lamps. One of the, oh, yeah, yeah, because it's going to be under the lights. Yeah, and get, get that thing good and tight and tighten it up. And that it, makes sense. And he, he forgot that he had a plastic head on there, and he <laughs> walked, walked over and did that and burned a hole in it. <laughs> yeah, I guess maybe we don't appreciate the luxury that we have of not having to, to worry about that on a day-to-day basis, yeah. I think. My old 75... It's been played a lot. I mean, way before, I mean, the original owner, they said he was, he was, uh, he played, I think he played, they say he played with a flat, uh, a flat pick. He ordered hmm. the banjo new and, but he got a five string neck in it. Huh. And it's a maple neck 75. Yeah. And up at the, I mean, it's, the neck is so skinny, but 
to say that's what he wanted it to be really skinny. It's it's almost too it's, it's too too narrow to play almost up here. Yeah, weird. Feels really good when you capo it about B. That's where it really feels okay. good, you know. But uh, when the second owner acquired it, it was missing brackets. A few, not a bunch, but a few. Okay. And it was from cranking on that hide, you know, and he wrung them off. Oh, no kidding. <laughs> yeah. Well, like stripped them or something maybe? Or? Yeah, just twisted them in two eventually after oh, years. Oh. And, you know. but, but never bothered to replace them, apparently. No. That's funny. <laughs> so, so back to sort of your playing trajectory, um, you know, we, we all know the band you ended up being in. Was playing with your dad something that always appealed to you? Or did you maybe think that you were going to branch out on your own? You know, I, I don't know if I really put too much thought into that, but I mean, Dad, he always had a good, really good band and, you know, good banjo player and everything. And I mean, it wasn't, I don't think I set out to <laughs> to do that, to yeah. be the banjo player, but just wanted to learn to do it, you know, mm-hmm. and never knowing. I mean, there was, I, we were pretty fortunate up there in Pennsylvania where I grew up. There was a lot of good players around. And you could get a, a jam together and not, you know, and never make a long distance phone call. I mean, there's guys <laughs> that lived in the area that, you know, they'd come in and dad did that a lot. He, he'd call guys, you know, just some random evening of the week. They'd be like, yeah, yeah. man, let's, yeah, I'll come down there and we'll and pick something. Professional caliber. Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. <laughs> when he did ask you to take the banjo job or I don't know how that worked out, was, was that kind of a big deal for you that he had that confidence in you to, hold it down for him yeah you know i had uh i started out with him he needed a bass player like immediately he needed a bass player he mm-hmm. was leaving actually leaving that day to go to be gone for uh, three days and i think it was like a july 4th weekend and he needed a bass player and i had i mean i wasn't really a bass player but uncle jerry's uh bass fiddle was there at the house for I don't know what, exactly why it was there, but it was there. <laughs> and uh, I'd play with records. And yeah. I, I liked it. You know, I, I still do. still like to play bass a little bit. But I'd never really played in a band. And Dad's like, you, you, you're going to have to go. You're going to have to play with us. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> you probably knew the songs better than just about anybody. <laughs> you know, I, I did. I, I knew the songs, you yeah. know, pretty much. And uh, and I stayed there for about a year. And, and Paul Silvius, he was the banjo player. And mm-hmm. I think it kind of came a time for him to move back up he was from up in in massachusetts he right i think his his folks were getting some age on him and stuff and i think he was thinking he probably needed to head back home you yeah. know and I, he he told my dad he said well it's it's inevitable he said you've got a banjo player you know and he's yeah. going to be a good one you know? yeah remember i came off got home from school one day Walked up from where the school bus let me out, and Dad was doing something on the bus. Of course, he was always working on the bus doing something, and uh, <laughs> like me- mechanically, you mean? <laughs> okay, <laughs> yeah. And uh, he said, "Well, guess you're going to be my new banjo player." And I said, "What?" And, you know? He said, "Yeah." He said, "Paul, Paul put in his notice." He said, "So, I mean, I was." I was glad. I was like, man, I was really just getting the hang of playing the bass. <laughs> yeah. But it was a good thing, you know, because I had to play time and just playing the bass. And then when I went to, to the banjo, then Jerry came back. Uncle Jerry came back. You know, and he's just. That's a perfect situation. Phenomenal. Yeah, you know? right. And at that time, you know, we were all still playing on individual mics and kind of spread out a little bit. But I stood between that guitar and that bass fiddle. So it was like. Rhythm section right yeah, here. You know. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> That's great. So I think people take it for granted that when you are, are in your family, you're just going to know how to play bluegrass. But I imagine there was a lot more hard work to it than, than just, you know, an automatic <laughs> thing. Do you remember working on anything specifically as you, as you developed your playing style? Right off the top of my head, I, I couldn't really tell you, but... I always, I would always, you know, go back and listen to, or I still go back and listen to Earl Scruggs. I mean, hmm. there's a good chance if, if you're hearing banjo playing at my house coming from a stereo or something, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's going to be Earl. <laughs> and uh, that was what I patterned it after. Hmm. Totally was learning to play like him, and then 
let you know all that Earl stuff. I was I was working with a, a little fella out here last night, showing him some things. I mean, he's just 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 picked up the banjo, but he knows a little bit, you know. Yeah, cool. And he kind of think he uh, he knows more than he thinks he knows. He's like, well, the only role I know is this, and he played it for me, and he yeah. played it exactly right. Yeah. And I said. That's one of the three that you're going to use all the time. And I said you just played it right. I mean, with a lick, he didn't just he didn't just play the three strings. He played a lick. You yeah, know? you can get a lot of mileage out of just <laughs> yeah. a, a roll. Oh yeah, that's what he played. And I'm okay, like, man, that's that's in so many Earl tunes. I mean, right. <laughs> yeah, if you, if you've got your timing down, and yeah, you just, yeah. Just and he did it. Doing. He did it exactly right, and in time. It had to slide good and everything. I'm like, now, man, I'm like, how long have you been fooling with this thing? Well, I, I just got this banjo. He plays, he plays some fiddle already. Huh, okay. And I think he might play some mandolin. But he's, I mean, he's just a young little fellow. So his ears are, he's got some ears open on him. And, yeah, yeah, sponge. Yeah, yeah that's so sponge. cool. Folks, we are in a golden age of online instrument instruction, and at the top of that world is Peghead Nation. Peghead Nation has streaming video courses in banjo, guitar, mandolin, fiddle, dobro, upright bass, and ukulele, so you can learn bluegrass, old time, and plenty of other styles from some of the most talented players and instructors in all of Roots music. Check out the courses they have and this is just for banjo you could get beginning or bluegrass banjo with bill evans Clawhammer banjo with evie laden wade ward style banjo with bruce molsky the banjo according to danny barnes and contemporary bluegrass banjo with wes corbett each of those courses include high quality video lessons downloadable notation and tab play along tracks and plenty of tunes and songs to play and the best thing yet is you're going to get your first month free just by being a listener of this show. So go to pegheadnation.com and use promo code PICKYFINGERS at checkout and claim your free month of the best instruction out there. And if you find yourself needing a banjo or accessories to get ready for those Peghead Nation courses, I highly recommend you check out Elderly Instruments, which is the world's most trusted source of new used and vintage stringed instruments, including banjos, guitars, violins, mandolins, ukuleles, all that stuff. They're going to have the best instruments you can find anywhere. And we're talking everything from the more affordable instruments for people starting out on up through the most highly sought after vintage instruments. Elderly Instruments has been family owned since 1972. And if you can't make it to their Lansing, Michigan showroom, you can see their full selection at elderly.com or give them a call at 517-372-7880 for some professional advice on all of your banjo and other stringed instrument needs. And you know what all these stringed instruments have in common? they all sound better with GHS Strings. GHS Strings is another sponsor of the Picky Fingers Banjo Podcast, and I'm proud to say they have been made in Battle Creek, Michigan since 1974. And if you don't want to take my word for it, maybe you'll believe such people as J.D. Crow, Sonny Osborne, and Bela Fleck, just a few of the many, many users of GHS Strings. So go check them out, ghsstrings.com. They have a wide selection of gauged sets so that no matter what you're looking for, you'll be able to find something there. So I guess maybe another way of asking that would be like if a if a player came to you for lessons and wanted to play exactly like Rob McCurry, what what types of things do you think are important elements of your style that you would teach someone that wanted to play just like you? Well, I know that uh, on you know on the material we play with Dad, I try and play the melody as close as I can, you know. Yeah. And I mean, I, I enjoy playing banjo tunes, but I would much rather take solos and play back up to a good singer mm-hmm. than play tunes, you know. And and uh, I've just always been that way. I've and that comes from my dad too. He's like, when you're listening to Earl, he said, don't just listen to the kickoff or or the break. Listen to all that pretty stuff he's playing behind Lester singing. Yeah. 
I mean, great, just great back, Kevin. I think that's that's. Uh, I mean, I can just I, I can play slow tunes and not ever take a solo and just play backup. I love playing backup. And, yeah. And then you know, like Sonny and JD, those guys, they played their own backup. You know, and their ideas and things they did. You know, Sonny with all that pedal steely kind of backup. Bye to you tomorrow. Pretend I feel no sorrow But when you're out of sight I know I'll cry For this heart of mine Can never say goodbye No, this heart of mine Can never say goodbye just beautiful, you know, and and JD with that those bluesy, you know, bluesy stuff, bending, right? you know, bending them chord, bending those those third string and all that. And well, a woman like that, all she does is hate you. She doesn't know what makes a man a man. Well, she talk about the times so she's been with you and speak your name to everyone she can. She's a devil in disguise You can see it in her eyes She's telling dirty lies She's a devil in disguise In disguise Unhappiness has been her Well, yeah, I'm, I'm really glad you brought that up because I think your backup in general is a really strong part of your playing would you mind going through maybe the way you back up each instrument and how you might approach those different things yeah you know fiddle uh usually you know if fiddle's going it's i just kind of you know keep it kind of open Or whatever it may be, try not to play exactly what he's playing. Try and stay off of him and just keep that timing, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, mandolin, you know, I do I do play some just chops on that sometimes, but sometimes I, I'll just roll through him too, you know. Okay. And uh, guitar's the one. Lead guitar's the one. It's like I can't decide what I like better. Yeah. Does 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 just chopping the chords? Does that does that sound better with the guitar? You know. Three of your strings on this thing are the same. As yeah, the guitar. right, right. <laughs> should I? Easy to get in the way. Yeah. Should I? <laughs> should I risk it, or should I uh, just play rhythm behind them? And you know, like uh, uh, Cody Buck Kilby that plays guitar with us, I'll ask him. I'm like, man, what do you want me to play behind? You? Yeah. What do you like? You know, who's that, you know, great banjo player too, and sure. Dobro, whatever. You yeah, know, yeah. He's got it. <laughs> One man band, right? And. Uh, He's like, man, bro, you just play like you, man. I like what you do. It's all good. And I'm like, well, that didn't help anything. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, and especially with a guy like that who could be first fret on his low E string one moment and, you know, 17th fret on the high E the next moment. But I can't sleep from listening to the train blow Roll up again to pine When I hear the great big engine roll down the line you're, you're trying to stay out of his way when he's <laughs> when he's going all over the place It's just yeah. like kind of a fool's errand in a, in a way, I think he's, Yeah, man <laughs> that, uh, I've, I've always enjoyed playing banjo and fiddle tunes I, just, that's, just the two of us, you know, I've always loved that one with Jason, you know, he's got such good timing. And that, that, that bowing arm, that right arm, you know. Yeah. And just, man, I'd just love to hear Lester, or hear Earl Scruggs and Benny Martin. Uh-huh. That timing, just, oh, it's a machine, you know. Well, talk about that more then, because I was going to mention anyway, some of my favorite recorded examples of your playing are on 
Jason's solo album, which I, I think is a really cool record. It's kind of it's kind of old now, I think. What was yeah. it from like the late nineties, maybe? Yeah, probably. But like, so, there's yeah. some great fiddle and banjo stuff on there. Yeah. So, yeah, he made a great record, man. working all that out you know it was kind of new to me in a way i wasn't i wasn't used to you know like trying to play note for note kind of solos on a fiddle mm-hmm. record you know yeah on a fiddle tune but he made us that was a great record he just he's just finishing another record it's and uh oh no kidding that'll be and, cool yeah it's it's good i've heard it you know it's, it's really good but uh yeah, well, Jason, he likes it too. He likes me and him. Just, just like sitting in the dressing room before the show. We just ding, 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 yeah. ding. <laughs> like, I mean, I, I know you said I know you said you do the the open chord. Is there is there more to it than that? Especially when it's just the the duo. Do you feel like you have to contribute a bit more than just the the open strings sometimes? You know, maybe I know uh, this. My dad had an old buddy who was a, he was a fine banjo player and a good fiddle player. He would come down and play with us a lot, on, just in the living room, you know. And he, had, he was a carny. He owned a, a carnival business. Oh, you know? no kidding. And uh, so he was off in the wintertime. Uh-huh. <laughs> he was, you know, spring through early fall, he was out. But his name was Bobby Diamond, and he loved Earl Scruggs and Benny Martin and Paul Warren. I mean, he just loved that stuff. And he would give me he would give me cassettes. Mm-hmm. He's like, here, some of the first live stuff I ever got was from him. Wow. You know? And... Uh, He'd be like, here, listen to that, you know. We'd put it on and be listening to it. And he's like, hey, hear that? See that fiddle? He's playing down low. And he said, listen to Earl. He's up the neck. Uh-huh. And then when the fiddle would go up high, Earl would go the other way. They he'd, switch. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> he'd get on the low end of the neck, you know. And, and uh, I was like, mm, he's right. You know, it's, that's kind of the way that works. You yeah. Know? He's probably the first guy I ever played a banjo and fiddle tune with. You know, he was a good fiddle player. There, okay. So. And, and and that's been your approach, like overall, is is mm-hmm. to just try to one person handle one part of the range and, and mm-hmm. the other person take the other. Yeah, and they, uh, I love all them too. I like Billy and low ground. I love that when you tune down C and you get that low note to you run up and down the neck with it, the way the Earl did. You know, uh-huh. man, that's that's uh, always been one of my favorites. You know. Yeah, absolutely. Another thing that I love your approach to is uh like the modal songs you know what i mean something like uh my love will not change and uh, you know i i feel like your dad sing tends to sing mm-hmm. quite a few of those is there any certain way that you think about those songs that is maybe different than like a standard one four five progression uh, you know it's kind of well kind of just goes back to the melody i think my way of thinking is like you know when he's singing there it's the blue notes, the modal notes, whatever. Uh, it's not the pretty notes. That's kind of how. That's kind of how. Because you know, I don't. I don't know anything about. I mean, I'm not trained or anything to to know what you call this and that. But you know, he's he's playing. The, you know, singing the blue notes and not the pretty ones. So you kind of <laughs> play what he's singing. You know, and, and play those blue notes. My love will not change. My love will not change. It just rolls like a river to the sea of your name. My love will not change. My love will not change. It's as steady as the rhythm of the pouring rain. Hey, my love is moving and it just won't stop. 
That's like you know, Ralph Stanley, for instance. That's some of that some of that Stanley stuff, you know, Pretty Polly or something like that. Absolutely, you know? yeah. And hear what he's playing, and he, he's not playing the pretty stuff. He, no, <laughs> he's playing the dirty stuff. Yeah, it's pretty. There, you know? It's pretty greasy. And uh, and man, some some of those uh, a lot of those you know old time kind of players, you know, mm-hmm. I can't play that way, but but to hear the way they they play, and sometimes that's out of a tuning, you know, but sure. uh, the way they play that like that modal like uh, like a lope in their lick, you know, and it's just. So different sounded to yeah. me, you know. Yeah. It's different than what you might hear in a straight tuning. But you know, a lot of times, well, you know, you can note your strings and, and get it out of it without retuning. But I really, guys that can play that stuff, I, I, I like to listen to that mm-hmm. you know, and, and hear what they're doing. And some of those guys blow me away. I've, I've never learned how to play like a claw hammer or some style or anything. But some of those guys that are good at it, it almost sounds like they're playing three fingers. <laughs> Yeah, it can it can be a little ambiguous sometimes. Well, they, sure. they pick out the notes, and it's almost it's in a roll pattern, right? You know, yeah, the arpeggiated kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. that just that blows me away. You know, that, remember the first time I ever saw Mark Johnson? Oh, sure. You know, I was like, <laughs> that guy. He he freaked me out. He was so good. I'm like, good golly, that guy, man. And uh, yeah, yeah, he's that's great. Some, he's some so new good. stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah you know. I know a, a lot of my stuff too is from listening to like Ralph Stanley, you know, the way he played and so soulful singing and his playing was so soulful, you know, for to those tunes and just man, hearing him play those modal notes, you know, just and getting them in there. He got them in here in, in there in his own way sometimes, you know, with the do do you feel comfortable maybe even demonstrating what you hear as the difference between Doing something in an Earl type of way versus something in a in a Ralph type of way, because I know that they obviously play pretty pretty differently from each other. Mm-hmm. You know, I heard a Flat and Scruggs live recording where they did Pretty Polly one time. Okay, and I was like, "Whoa, what's this? Never heard them do that." You know, right? And uh, it was pretty early on. You know, like in the early fifties. You know, and uh, of course. You know, everybody's probably pretty familiar with Ralph's way of doing it. Yeah. And uh, Earl, he he put the, he put those modal notes in there too. You know, where I don't think his playing's really actually known for that so much. But no. But he you know he played we well, still play bluesy things. But you know, hell, Ralph he played he played the whole thing just bluesy as all get out. You know, uh-huh. that recording or that live show of that pretty Polly. I was like, wow, that was cool. You know, and it, of course, everything Earl played was cool. But, <laughs> you know, say like Ralph, he'd play, uh, say. Uh-huh. It's something like that, and I'm out of tune. I heard that thing, and the best I can remember, it's been a while, but Earl, he kind of. Yeah. Uh, ah, I forgot how I did it. That's what Earl did? Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah, great. That <laughs> That's really cool. <laughs> Gotta love it. And uh, I was like, me and my brother, we were talking to Ralph one time and uh, my brother said Ralph who's your favorite banjo player he said Earl Scruggs wow you know okay and he said when uh, Flat and Scruggs left Monroe he said Earl actually came out with Stanley's and, and traveled with him just 
for a few days or a week, you know, just traveling. Just around. hanging out? Yeah, just hanging out. Okay. Just, and Earl would sit there in the back seat of the car with his banjo out going down the road and play, and, you know. Huh. Ralph, he's the you know, best thing in the world. <laughs> that sounds all right to me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you know, Ralph, he's another one. You know, he can play a claw hammer or two finger. Yeah. Two finger, you know. How and, cool. Uh, mountain bands are playing, you know. I mean, I've heard a lot about the Stanley Brothers learning songs off of, like, the Opry show to play, you know, maybe even the next night to their audiences. So it's interesting that Flat and Scruggs kind of did the same thing <laughs> in reverse. If you, if you said it was, like, a really early yeah. show, they were kind of going both ways with it. Mm -hmm. That's pretty cool. I'd love to hear a bit about, I mean, I know we're <laughs> skipping all sorts of history with, with your dad's band, but I would love to hear how you feel about the, the evolution, especially now with the Traveling McCurries being embraced by like jam band scene and stuff like that. That's got to be kind of crazy for you after, after playing these <laughs> bluegrass stages for so many years to, <laughs> yeah. to be in these like really different type of environments I, I don't know to just say, say what you what you think about all that or what have you noticed about how the band is being embraced by different crowds yeah you know it's uh it's, it's been really great i mean we dad my dad he it's he's a a funny thing in himself i don't know how else to put it but he got embraced by the jam bands mm -hmm. i mean any idea how you know, I think it was just the acceptance of, like, you know, Fish, for one, you know. Fish, they do some of his songs on their show, and right. they tell who it is. We got this song from Del McCurry. Who's that guy? You know, uh -huh. and that's <laughs> go, all it go, takes. Go and check he's, it out. You know, and he's like in the club now or something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think a lot of that came from that, and just doors open. You know, we we did uh, a pretty extensive tour with Leftover Salmon years ago. That was, I mean, that was great. It was so much fun. Those <laughs> those guys are so much fun. <laughs> I love them, and uh, I mean, I love their music and, and love them as people too. They're just great people. And, we played a lot of shows there, and got we got in front of their audience, and you know, they got in front of our audience too. You know, mm -hmm. and, uh, just things like that. I think it it opened a lot of doors for for that. You know, there's there's not a not a whole lot of uh, what what I would consider you know traditional bluegrass bands that get in the club like that. Sure, <laughs> yeah, that's why it's so extraordinary. I think, yeah. And I think just just with the lineage and you know we've I mean we know all these all these we know them all I mean we know all these guys and and being put into uh, situations with them just playing venues together or festivals together and mm -hmm. setting in together you know I think I think that's how that kind of came about you know and uh, but it seems like it's gone both ways like the the crowd has embraced you but it probably takes a lot for your band to make that step and like, okay, we're going to do these types of venues and events now. Like yeah. that's, that's, that's quite a change. Yeah. I would think, especially yeah. for someone like your dad who has such a, a long history of, of completely <laughs> different type of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, he he seems was, to roll with it really well. Oh yeah. yeah. That was, you know, when we stepped out as the travelers, basically it was my dad, it was dad's idea. He's like, you boys need to get something of your own going. You know, he, Something happens to him, or you know, or he wants to retire, whatever. 
Yeah. He's like, you boys might be starting all over. He said, I wouldn't want that for you. Sure. He said, get something going now. And uh, we did. And it happened to be different yeah. when you've, you know, we know this one way of playing. I mean, we've, we've, me and my brother both, I mean, and, well, Jason, Alan, we've all played with Del McCurry forever. You know? Yeah, yeah. To have something that was more than the Del McCurry band without Del McCurry. You know? Yeah. Because there was some of that. There was some of that publicity. I won't lie to you. There was some of that early on, you know. We knew we had to do something different and different material, number one, because, I mean, we're all kind of still going to play like we play because that's how we play. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How could you not? <laughs> Yeah, we had to. Uh, you know, but Ron, Ronnie's material. picking up a electric mando. Like you're, you're definitely uh, changing it up a bit. Mm -hmm. So in some fun ways. So yeah, and it's uh, it's been great. You know, it's fun. I I, I love doing both. You know, mm -hmm. I really do. It's it's fun to get out there. You know, with with travelers and get out there and get loud. Yeah. <laughs> It yeah. is, you know, it's fun. You yeah, know? just a lot more yeah. energy running mm -hmm. into the space, yeah. And with Dad, you know, we uh, he's the centerpiece. And sure. We're all, we're all working around him and, and listening to him, you know, and, yeah. uh, and uh, as you should, because you know, he's the boss and he's the singer. Mm -hmm. You work around the singer, you know, I think, and he's, the, he's also the rhythm section. I mean, he's so much a part of that with his guitar. And, uh, you know, the Travelers is kind of, you know, we're all, well, we're all basically partners in it, you know, mm -hmm. so we all, not that we, you know, we, we all have input with, with dad, you know, we, we all bring songs and yeah. if he likes it, he'll cut it, you know, and, uh, you know, travelers, you know, we, we all weigh in and bring material and get together and run them down and decide if it's going to work <laughs> or not, you know, yeah. well, this may be one we do on stage, but. We'll probably never record this thing. <laughs> right. You know. <laughs> and that's okay. But yeah. you know, yeah. you need material regardless. Yeah, know. totally. But uh yeah, the jam scene, I mean, maybe it's not even jam, it's beyond that. The people that you may play one of these big giant festivals and they're on it and they send word that they want to meet you or something because they're fans. Like they they've been listening to you and you think Why in the world would they be listening to this? <laughs> you know, it's so far out of their wheelhouse of yeah. what they do, but they're listening, you know, yeah. and they like it, you know. That's been that's been pretty cool. Yeah, that's you know? great. Let's talk about some some gear. Take take us through like your your main instrument and all the all the parts. You know how banjo players are. They want to know about all the bridges and the picks <laughs> and the tail pieces. And right. so tell tell us what you got going. Well this is a uh this is a style seventy five I've uh, I've had this thing for about thirty years. It's a nineteen thirty six pot, but it was a raised head, hmm. and uh, I played it as a raised head for several years. And uh, Steve Huber, he put a flat, he put one of his rings in it not long after he was getting going, really. Okay. And uh, I got this thing from a guy named Randy Snotty out in California. He was a he was a wheeler dealer in instruments, you know, guitars, and banjos, and what have you, and. Uh, the neck is a, uh, there was a mandolin builder, his name was Bob Givens, and he was out. Yeah, R.L. R. Givens, is yeah. that what it usually says yeah. on him? Yeah, uh -huh. okay, I'm familiar, yeah. Yeah, he he built this neck, and I love it. I wish I could find another neck, because if, if they all feel like this, you know, it's, it's, uh -huh. I love the feel of this neck. And that's one of the reasons I've played this thing so much, is because I'm just used to it, you know. Yeah. Uh, my own flathead, it, it sounds great, but it's just harder to play than this one is. The one me. with that weird narrow yeah. neck, you yeah. said. Yeah. And, uh, but it's a 36, uh, 75. It's, uh, this head that's on here has been on here since Steve put that ring. He put this head on this banjo when he put that ring in there. So that's still the ring that's in there and the, <laughs> and the head. <laughs> it's, it's, so old. it's nice and settled in. Yeah. And, and, uh, of course, the presto tailpiece and, and this bridge actually has been on here so long, I can't. I don't remember what it is. It's, it's not marked it's at not all or marked. anything. Okay. And I don't. I don't really remember <laughs> okay. what that is. And I got pretty much just a straight up setup. Got the old Grover pancake tuners, you know, and uh, just had. Uh, yeah, I just had this one refretted from top to bottom, and that's that was it. Needed that. 
<laughs> Freshen plays, up a bit. Yeah, yeah. plays so much better. And with that, I was able to kind of bring the action down just a tad. And okay. That's been nice, you know. Uh, well, it, man, it's sounded really great on stage. Do you, do you know what, is that a, a microphone that you always use, or is that just what? <laughs> you use whatever they have? Or? You know, I think that was uh, today. You mean, I think that was yeah. just a 57, just a sure. Was it? That's okay. 57. But now we are, we're plugged in too. We're using wireless pack. With Dell's band or with the Travelers? Yeah, with, Del, with Dell's oh, band. Oh, no kidding. I didn't realize yeah. that. Interesting. We're, we're wireless. I've got a uh, Fishman Rare Earth in it. You okay. Know? And uh, Sound Man, he, he kept, kind of blends them. and Gets the blend. He doesn't yeah. use a lot of pickup. He just, but he's like it. It keeps you in the mix with it, you know. And, yeah, and I guess to our point with the jam band, if you are playing a venue that's a little crazier, he can, you know, yeah, bump that part up yeah. to, yeah, that's, to give you the yeah. That's that's helped a lot. We I think one of the first times we did it, we were we were booked on this big Canadian country music festival. And it was you know, huge, you know, biggest <laughs> stage you've ever seen, you know. And uh, Key, our sound man, he's like, man. Because we already had pickups from yeah. from doing traveler stuff. He's like, man, if I could get my hands on some wireless stuff, would you guys be game for plugging in? Because he's like, I'm afraid I'm going to lose you, you know, yeah. on this this stage, and you know, you never know. And it was great. I mean, you didn't. I mean, we didn't know we were plugged in either. I mean, we <laughs> knew we were plugged in, but once you turn it on, it's kind of, it's yeah, kind of the same. Yeah. yeah, you know, it was like it, it didn't it didn't sound. I mean, it still sounded good. Like, you know, yeah. So we've kind of, most rooms we do that now, or definitely festivals, you know, he, he can get a lot more out of you if he needs it. You know. Is that the same rig and setup that you use for traveling McCurry's gigs? It is. The Fishman? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. Yeah, I've got the Fishman and the uh, Grace out in Colorado. I'm using one of their preamps. It's the the Alex, I think, is okay. mine. And, uh seems it does great you know it's a good piece of gear and that's about all i use i'm uh i want to plug when when we're plugged in with the travelers and i'm using the you know the per, the, the preamp and everything <laughs> i got i've put some towels inside of it you know oh, okay just to make sure the feedback <laughs> stays <laughs> stays out of the way right yeah you're doing the monitors i i mean i guess speaking of that we're we're sort of if you got a few more minutes i i would love to rewind and maybe talk about like the the single or maybe double large diaphragm condenser technique that you guys were so famous for for mm -hmm. a really long time. What was your experience with that setup, and what would you maybe say to a, a band that's thinking about doing that in terms of advice or cautionary yeah. tales? You know, they're uh, those uh, those large diaphragm mics. I mean, they do sound great, and they they work great with all acoustic instruments. I think you know. Mm -hmm. We've had, you know, we've played shows and maybe had an opener or something. They're like, can we just use your setup? You know, basically that one or two mic setup. And uh -huh. we're like, yeah, sure, you know. And uh, what what I've noticed about, which, you know, that's the way my dad started out playing music was around one mic. And, I mean, you have to work the mic, obviously, but you have to get in the mic, uh -huh. you know. Noticed a lot of people they they you know they, they get back here you know they get back off of it and it's just not I mean they will pick up from a distance trust me <laughs> but but to get that presence you have to be in it you know you have to yeah. work it pretty close you know yeah you'll get in trouble if you mm -hmm. if that's just where you are yeah that's the main thing with that you know we we did some kind of it was like a well what here would be like a PBS radio thing but it was in Sweden hmm. and there was a uh, a bit of a language barrier. <laughs> <laughs> and we had to do this live radio show. Like and, between the, the producers or whatever? Yeah, you're well, about, between or? us and them, you know. Yeah, yeah. They didn't know what we wanted, <laughs> and we didn't know what they wanted. But So what we did was we took... They had... But they had great microphones. Uh -huh. like really great large diaphragm microphone. Yeah. And uh, Mike Bubb was with us then. And, and Bubb, he would... He would kind of handle some of that kind of thing with sound guys wherever you know, and he knows he knows about microphones, and he's like he sees these mics over there. He's like, man, these are like these are top of the line. These are the best of the best, <laughs> cream of the crop mics. He's like, you know, we could just put up one or two and work them and play them. He said, I, I think that's going to 
<laughs> that's going to clarify this headache, you yeah. know? And we did. And it was sounded so good to just, you know, just stand around like that and play up close together where you can hear each other and you're not depending on, you know, monitors and or anything. You're just, it's just like sitting around playing and jamming in a room together. You Wait, know? that's how that all started? That's, was because was because of that Sweden gig. Yeah, that, that's oh, kind of how. No kidding. That's kind of how we started to do that. It was, it was, it just, it was so good, you know. And even, I mean, the thing, the the bad thing about it is, it does, it does lack the power in a big room or a big stage. Yeah. But when you can stand around that close and play together, the you tone, can hear each other, yeah. and you, you know, it's. It makes it it makes it easier to play, you know. Sure, and and play tight and everything, but uh, yeah, that's kind of where that one. That's kind of where okay. that came about, you know. Talk about how the choreography works. Was there a, a specific system that you that you <laughs> developed? <laughs> you know, not not really, but but when I've uh, thought about it, you know, Dad, he just kind of he would just kind of move in front of the mic and then back to his left. You know, yeah, and you know, bass is kind of behind there, and they're, neither one of those are in your way. But you know, we got you know banjo, fiddle, mandolin. We would kind of uh, rotate in a circle, yeah, kind of. You know, because usually, if say if if all three of us were going to be taking a solo in a tune or something, you know, uh, say you know the banjo kicks it off. Well, I can kind of go around. I can kind of back out there and go around to my right, yeah, in the circle. And move back around, and I'm because I'm I'm safe now. I don't have to do that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you get to escape. You get to duck and, out of the way. And then the next guy's kind of in there, pretty close for when it's time for him to solo. But know? I but I guess the confusion could come when like maybe you felt like rather than going to your right, you needed to just back straight up. So was so was that a, a planned thing that we're going to have well, this flow that or yeah. it just, just worked out that way. <laughs> You know, it, it kind of both, you know, since dad had done that, you know, he, that's the way he started out. He said, well, you know, you gotta, you just gotta watch each other and make sure you ain't running over top of each other or, <laughs> or backing up into somebody yeah. when they're behind you, you know? And I mean, we've, we've never had any major collisions, but we've definitely bumped into each other. You know, Those fiddle bows can be dangerous <laughs> in some of those close quarters, man. <laughs> I, I kind of worry about it, but you have both of your eyes still, so uh, apparently nothing too yeah. <laughs> too bad has happened. We played a show down in South Carolina one time, and and a guy went out to the record table, which my mom, she she still handles uh, merchandise and stuff for Dad, for oh, around cool. with Dad. And that was his main concern. He said, somebody's going to get their eye put out with that guy's <laughs> fiddle bow up there, you know. <laughs> it, man, it's 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 a miracle, I guess, that it hasn't happened. But st- stick with what works if you if you got your choreography down. <laughs> I guess that's the lesson. Well, hey, I've taken up a ton of your time. Is there anything I forgot to to ask you that you'd love for people to know about your your banjo playing or or oh, anything man. like that? Just you know, the general open floor question. If, if there's <laughs> something else that you wanted to say. Man, I don't know. I guess uh, practice as much as you can. That's the main thing with with trying to trying to keep this thing from whipping you. you know? <laughs> I yeah. don't I don't get to practice as much as I'd like to. Which you know that that happens as <laughs> as you get older and you have responsibility. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know you don't have time to do everything you'd like to do. But uh, yeah, that kid you were teaching the licks to last night. He's he's going home for hours and yeah. Not a, not a not a care in the world, probably. <laughs> right. Pretty jealous. Uh, give us some some websites for people who who want to keep up on your your tour dates and recordings and stuff. Where should they? Where yeah. should they go on the internet? Uh, DelMcCurryBand dot com, TravelingMcCurries dot com, RainmakerManagement dot com. You can go there and find out a lot too. What's happening or. You know, these days, just good old Google works pretty good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you'll figure it out somehow. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, me too, me too. So mm. usually with voice to text, in which case the your last name always ends up looking like an Indian uh, dish. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it sounds delicious, the C-U-R-R-Y, curry, something like that, but whatever. <laughs> I like that too, so it's, it's all good. Mm. 
Well, thank you for for taking the time to talk to me, man. Really enjoy your music and uh, looked up for you for a long time. So oh, I, shoot, I really man. appreciate talking to you. <laughs> thank you, man. I appreciate it. It's been fun. And that's going to do it for this episode of the Picky Fingers Banjo Podcast. Thank you so much for joining me. We heard a bunch of sound clips this episode, and they were Love is a Long Road by the Delma Curry Band, Listening to the Rain by the Osborne Brothers, Love So Far Away by Del McCurry and the Dixie Pals, This Heart of Mine by the Osborne Brothers, Devil in Disguise by J.D. Crow and the New South, Southbound by the Travelin' McCurries, Carter Country by Jason Carter, My Love Will Not Change by the Del McCurry Band, and then two different versions of Beauty of My Dreams, first by Del McCurry Band and then by Fish. Never thought I'd get to work them into this show, but hey... Here we are. Once again, special thanks to Sean McKilney, today's Patreon supporter of the show. Everyone head over to patreon.com slash banjo podcast to support the show and join us for that VIP lounge video meetup happening this upcoming Sunday, June 26th at 2 p.m. Eastern or contact the show picky fingers banjo podcast at gmail.com. Hope to hear from you and hope to see you next time.